Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, ACO this Saturday morning. Uh, we have uh, with us Barbara Gruber, who uh, I actually met almost 11 years, we'll call it 11 or 12 years ago, uh, when she and I did a event for the Children's in the NIH. Uh, and uh, <laughs> as the story goes, uh, I didn't really know her too well. She was actually introduced uh, to me by Glenn Kessler, who teaches at the uh, of the our, um, atelier, the Compass Atelier up in, uh, in Kensington area. And uh, so Barbara kind of shows up to this event with, uh, you know, in the canvases and paintbrushes. And uh, I didn't, she, you know, kind of like wild energy to her, which was really contagious and exciting. And I, I you know, I was painting next to her and I, I look over at one point and she kicked her shoes off and she's half dancing, half painting. And she had about 20 paintbrushes clutched in, in her non-dominant hand and kind of scrubbing away paint vigorously. In this, and I was just in awe of her ability to not only capture the event the way it was supposed to, but just look like she was enjoying herself more than any other person in the entire uh, building. Uh, and uh, so, my father actually bought the painting that that uh, Barbara had created that evening, and I was supposed to ship it home to him, and I uh, neglected to do that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I like the painting so much that I just said, "Dad, I'm keeping this," and he uh, conceded, of course. But uh, uh, to this day, I, whenever I walk downstairs, I can see Barbara's painting from the event. So I am a huge admirer of her work and her paintings. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how much joy that painting brings me whenever I walk downstairs in our house. So thank you, Barbara. Oh, and I'd love to uh, pass the baton to you and just say, uh, I cannot wait to hear more about your work. And, uh, and thank you for joining us this Saturday. Oh my gosh, thank you. That's, that did my heart so much good. <laughs> That's really amazing. Um, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for having this. Um, and I just, I just want to say, I, I remember when we met, I remember that event, the music was amazing. It was all Samba music. It's all the stuff that I love. And I'm so glad that the painting turned out because I, I was dancing a lot. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. And, um, yeah, I have all these notes and, and everything has, has left my brain. Um, Oh, but I, one of the things I want to say is one of the things that gets me going about painting is when I look at a painting and I can't tell how they did it. Jordan's paintings do that. You know, I can, you can go in as a painter, as an artist, you can go in and you can dissect it. Oh, they did this here and that there and the other. And I look at Jordan's paintings and it's like, I don't know how he did it. So one day I'm going to get down there and watch and see how it's done. But um, thank you. Thank, thank you all. One of the things I wanted to start out with was just about how I got here, because I didn't take, I took a kind of a circuitous route to become a painter. I grew up in a family that we, we had culture, but art wasn't something that you learned. And my parents grew up in the depression. Um, we drew on the backs of envelopes and napkins and brown paper bags and a drawing pad was unheard of. My cousins had the 64 pack of Crayola crayons. I remember this because I think I had eight. And I was so envious. And, um, but my sister, is a, she's, a, she's older than I am. And she was in high school already when I was about eight years old. And she took an art class. And this was, these images were from her book, Mainstreams of Modern Art. And I was fascinated with them. The uh, drawing on the left is by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. I think it's a silver point drawing of um, Elizabeth Siddall. And the other two are Ang drawings, you know, these incredibly smooth, uh, beautiful figures. And uh, and I was fascinated with figures from the time I was a child. That's what I wanted to draw always. And um, so my sister talked my parents into getting me um, some some drawing uh, uh, materials. We got we got some pads and 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 I got to draw and. Um, and when I got older. Uh, I, I I got my GED, it was the 70s. I kind of bypassed high school a little bit and got my GED when I was 18 and um, got married and had a baby. Uh, and when I was, my son was three, I decided to go back to college. And um, I took a drawing course and a drafting course 
and a class called Career Development as a Life Process, where you figured out, they give you the Myers-Briggs tests. And um, and I, I wanted to draw. And, and they told me, if you want to be an artist, you go see Lima Ziglitas, and he'll tell you if you have what it takes. And I walked in there with my drawing one sketch pad and this Little, he's, he was he was not a, a tall man, very thick Latvian accent, and he looked at me, and he said, "This is not art. You are not artist." And he, I don't know what I said or did to infuriate this guy, <laughs> but I said, "Okay, I'm going to be a drafter," and that's what I did for about the next fifteen years or so, and uh, I did eventually go back. Um, and I, I took classes with him. Um, I got there because eventually I got a job as an animator because I kept drawing, even you know, doing these, having these drafting jobs. And I got a job as an animator at Microprose Software, which was up in Hunt Valley. And I worked there for about six months. I was not as good as the others. I had not been to school. Um, and Six months after I got hired, all the women and one man that they had hired three weeks before got fired. And uh, I, I asked, I'm sure they hired the guy to avoid a lawsuit. I asked my boss why they thought all the women got fired. And he said, well, maybe they thought the men had families to support. <laughs> so I went back and told my son I didn't have a job. And uh, don't get me wrong, I would have gotten laid off anyway. I wasn't that good and nobody liked me. So that was it. But in the meantime, I had gotten very sick. I was really tired. I had gained a lot of weight. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. And I thought I was going to die. And I was collecting unemployment and unemployment would pay for a training program. And college was considered a training program. And I had learned at Microprose that college was where you could learn how to paint. They had amazing artists there. Ann Walker, Anne Marie Race, Nick Rusko Berger, Bob Kathman. And um, I decided I was going to go back to school and I was going to just take art classes. And by the time they figured out what I was doing, I would be dead and I wouldn't have to pay back my student loans, which clearly didn't happen. Sally May and I are on intimate terms or were for a long time. And um, what I had was thyroid disease. And I mention it because I think it's often underdiagnosed and diagnosed as depression. And it took a few more years to get diagnosed with that. Once they put me on the right dose of medicine, I remember the morning I woke up and realized I was gonna have to pay back my student loans. So um, it's been great. It's a very simple thing. I just take one pill a day and, and I'm fine. So I went back to college and I went back to Catonsville and Lyman Ziglitis was one of the best teachers I ever had. I never told him who I was. Uh, uh, he he uh, actually, that this is one of his watercolors and um, we had a really terrific relationship. <laughs> and when I left and went to the Maryland Institute, I took a lot with me that that he had taught. And um, I can hear his voice behind me, you know, saying, get out your good paper. And he was just a- Can you repeat his name, please, Barbara? Lyman's, L-A-I-M-O-N-S, Eglitis, E-G-L-I-T-I-S, Eglitis. Very influential on a lot of people. Uh, Cadenceville had a terrific art program. They still do, I think. So then I went to Micah. And I was told at Micah to take a class with Mark Carnes. And I will tell you to do the same thing. Anybody who can, I don't care if he's teaching microbiology, take a class with him. You, you're going to get something out of it. And these are his, these are self-portraits that he's done. He is a master at ink wash. He, they're beautiful ink wash drawings. This is an older portrait. I snagged these off his website and, um, and a, and a, and a, and a self-portrait as well in oil. And this is another one of the ink drawings. And they're these beautiful, intimate moments, you know, uh, and they're just really about the light. And when I got there at MICA, all I wanted to draw was people. But in Mark's class, like a head of broccoli became the most interesting thing you could look at. And he really, I think drawing and painting in general, you learn how to see differently. And he really, um, helped me to, to do that. He, um, I have notes here, which I've completely lost. And uh, I, I just, just the things that he said, you know, don't paint the object, paint the light, the way the light hits the object. Um, 
and the way he talked about even things like size and scale and, and composition as just one more element, um, not the be all and end all, about different sensibilities. Uh, a very light drawing isn't less powerful than a high contrast drawing or painting. And, you know, a lot of a lot of these things. Oh, and the biggest thing was time has hi. Time has nothing to do with how good or how bad a painting is. And I can attest to this myself. <laughs> a 20 minute drawing can be way better than a 20 year painting that you've been banging on uh, for forever. So he was a huge influence uh, on my work. And he showed us an artist named Wendy Arton, who's a watercolor artist. Uh, she, I don't know if she lives in Pennsylvania or, or Rome, but these are some of her ink wash drawings, very um, beautifully uh, seen and stated. And uh, Fairfield Porter, who I'd seen before, but I really, you know, Mark had this terrific slideshow and that idea of color massing and letting shadow stay in shadow and light stay in light and not picking at them. Uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia, who is called in Spain, Senor Lopez and regarded as, as kind of a demigod. These are some of his uh, paintings. And this is his, I think his most famous painting called, uh, um, Gran Via, where he stood in that crosswalk for seven years and painted this. And it looks like he painted every detail, but when you get up close to it, it's just a mess. It's great. And this was how I wanted to paint. I, I wanted to study with him, but he was in Spain. Uh, this is, these are also, oh, by the way, this, this piece of steak, that's cut out of a magazine. So he's just a, a fantastic painter. He's still alive. He's like 120 or something now. And I think he still paints every day. This is a drawing of his uncle. He's only he in his 80s, Barbara. No, like he's older than that. No, he's 88. Yeah. I'm pretty 88? sure. Okay. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. I trust you. I trust you. I everybody everybody over 40 looks ancient to me now. Same with myself. <laughs> it's, it's okay. But he's he's terrific. And he's also supposed to be extremely generous and a fantastic teacher. He does workshops and things like that. And uh He's 88. And he, he got famous for these, these big paintings of Madrid. Uh, and, and he goes out and he paints. And I did get to see one of his retrospectives when I went to Spain. Um, but just look at look at like the way that eyebrow comes up here, right? And and on her face. Like you're watching something the way you see it. You don't focus on one thing at one time. And you can see his process. And that was something. Sort of. And that was something that Mark talked about also, about painting the experience um, or, or conveying that experience to your viewer and um, just having that experience when you're painting, that that's really so important. And that's what this did. And I, my apologies to Senor Lopez if I advanced his age by 30 years. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And I'm sure he'll let it slide. <laughs> This is an amazing painting. Um, this is a painting by Leonard Anderson. And uh, it's interesting that the Jiffy Pop is probably no longer made. And it's a very cultural thing. If, if you're from another country, you don't even know what it is. <laughs> and, but Leonard, uh, when Mark showed us these slides, uh, he, I, I was just taken by them. Look at this check tablecloth. I mean, there's not a square in it. And you can see every square. And, and he he just, the nuance, the tone um, that Leonard would get, these portraits are so subtle and so amazing. He looked at a lot of Degas. Degas was like his idol. And um, I did get to study with, with Leonard um, by a fluke. And this painting was what did it for me. And I decided that was who I wanted to study with in grad school. I knew he was at Brooklyn College. Um, and I decided that was that was where I wanted to go. But but when the when the time came uh, to to go to Brooklyn College, uh, it was um, email had just started, and uh, Brooklyn College wasn't answering their email, and they didn't answer the phone, and there were rumors that Leonard was dead, and that and he wasn't teaching, or that he was ill and he wasn't teaching, or he was dead and ill and he wasn't teaching, and um, that wasn't true, as I found out. Um, this is also one of my influences. I just, I saw this sweet potato. And, I mean, 
Can you think of anything else after you see a sweet potato like that? Uh, that is called I am Venus of Mount Washington. And, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's so funny when you, when you start looking at master paintings, you just sort of see them everywhere and that's it. These were some of the paintings I did in Mark's class, the drawings. And uh, also Richard Diebenkorn was a huge um, influence if you can't tell by the painting on the right. Um, and these were done uh, with Lenart. And when I was at Brooklyn College, my sister had told me that, you know, if I couldn't find a place to stay, I, you know, until I found a place to stay, I could stay in her basement on Long Island. So I lived in her basement for about two years because I could never find a place that I could afford in Brooklyn. And I was able to go out every day and paint in, in grad school. And when I stayed up in New York, it was like a residency because my sister is this incredible cook. And I would come home from a day of painting and dinner's on the table. If I wanted to talk about my painting, I could. If I didn't, I didn't have to. And I got up the next morning and did it all again. And um, the painting on the left is Ocean City on 65th Street. That um, that took a while to get done. That was started, I think, in, in, the, in the aughts. And I think I finished it in 2010. The painting on the right, I think, was, was done in the, in the aughts. This is also Ocean City. Um, and they were, you know, I would go out and I would bang on these. Some of them were really quick, some of them not. This took several months. And it's on paper mounted on board. And it's in my living room. <laughs> and um, I, didn't, I didn't talk about how I got to, to Leonard's class. I had um, been accepted to UPenn and I, it wasn't a good fit. There was not a whole lot of... Um, encouragement for observational painters. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Andrew Forge and um, Jake Berteau were there and um, Jake had just moved to upstate New York and was painting landscapes. So they understood what I was doing and they were very helpful and encouraging. And when I got home, uh, Barry Nemet of MICA told me, take this class with Israel Hirschberg. He would bring Israeli students to the States to look at representational painting because there wasn't any there. And every weekend we would visit a different New York artist studio. And the first studio we visited was Lenart's, the reports of his death having been greatly exaggerated. And so I, I um, left UPenn and enrolled in, um, in Brooklyn College, which was terrific. Uh, first of all, you're in New York. So visiting artists can come see you. And we had terrific visiting artists all the time. Uh, we had Leonard, who, uh, whose voice I can still hear behind me. I, and I can, I, can hear him, I can hear him sneer as he says, what color is that? <laughs> and once he said that, I, I immediately took the cobalt violet light out of my palette. I never used it again. <laughs> and, and I can also hear him saying, too much paint. You're using too much paint. Um, but he was, it was, I'm so grateful to have gotten to study with him and to study at Brooklyn College with Jack Flam and so many other great teachers and a terrific cohort of students. It, it was really wonderful. Uh, so this was painted um, when I was 50, I guess. This was in 20, 2008 or 2009. And I had had open heart surgery and I, and I wasn't able to paint after that because you can't move your arms. And um, I never really thought about it, but my left arm is not even in this painting. And, uh, you know, there's something that happens, I think, when you're watching and when you're looking at these close observations, something happens that talks about uh, whatever is happening in your life or, or whatever you're looking at. And I like this portrait. I think it's got a lot of Fairfield Porter in it and a lot of the influences of so many of the artists that I love. Um, and this is a painting, this is the start of a, of a painting that I did in 2010 when I was living in um, Millburg, Virginia. And I, this is, I started it in March of 2010 and I finished it a couple years later. But this was the first day and then this was a couple of weeks later. This is about four feet by four feet. And then a couple months later, and then this is the final painting on the right. And at the same time I was working uh, on this painting over here, it's also four feet by four feet. And I would go out in these fields and work. And it was great. Middleburg um, 
much like certain areas of Long Island, has a fair amount of disposable income. So when people see you working, they're interested and they want to buy your paintings. And um, and I had uh, galleries there that, uh, that that showed my work. And I also had a gallery in Annapolis that uh, Bob introduced me. We, we both showed at this wonderful gallery called La Petite Gallery in Annapolis. Um, that was out of grad school. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about making a living. This is the final painting of the other one. And, that, and I, what I'm doing now, I'm working on this right now. I decided that I was going to work from those studies and see if I could do another painting that was different, maybe out of a different time of year or a different thing. And it's, it's very difficult for me to work from my imagination and uh, these other things. So, so that's, uh, that's in progress. I, I did that before I left for Romania. But I also want to talk about making a living. When I, when I got out of grad school, I was very lucky to be hired at several different schools. I taught three classes a semester at Villa Julie. I taught one class a semester at Hopkins. I taught a class a semester at Howard Community College. That's five classes a semester right there. And I taught in the summers. And uh, adjuncts are paid oh, 15 to 50% of what a full-time faculty member makes. We get no benefits. We can't even contribute to our own retirement. We can buy health insurance at a discount rate but at that time, it was it was outrageous. I did it, but it was outrageous. Uh, and so time for painting was precious. Uh, so I really you know, loved living in this area where all I got to do was get up and paint. I stacked all my, my classes that I taught in two or three days a week. So like Monday, I, would, I taught three classes. Like I would go from Villa Julie to, um, to Hopkins to Howard County. And on Tuesday, I would go from Villa Julie to wherever else I was teaching at that point. And I also picked up classes at the Yellow Barn and different workshops and places like that. But um, hopefully it's changing. And that corporate structure, uh, which started in the 80s of people hiring with no benefits and cheap labor, hopefully that's going to um, get better. Uh, these, these were painted on a road trip out to Colorado. Um, I was, I was dating a very nice man who wanted to get married. And uh, I said, well, you know, you've got a month and I've got a month. Let's take a road trip. <laughs> and all it took was three weeks. <laughs> we, we did not get married. <laughs> we drove back from Boulder in 18 hours of icy silence. We are friends today, but probably because we didn't get married. And uh, these are paintings of the Grand Canyon, in case you didn't know. Bob has the one on the left. And the one on the right is upstairs, available. But these were, um, I highly recommend traveling across this country and by car because it's vast and diverse and incredible. And you really only see it when you're there. You can't see it from the air. Um, this is a painting that was done um, after after that one, this was winter. This was from oh, the view from Ann Walker's studio in Moncton. And it was a winter painting. Um, it's 24 by 24. And throughout all this time, I was painting at beaches and, and traveling. Um, by this time, I had a Honda Element, which was great. A Honda Element is like, it was designed for surfers. You know, there's this hole in the middle where you can stick your surfboard in, in there. But surfers never bought it. It's bought by people like me who wanted like a little work truck that they could just empty out and throw all their stuff in. I could, I could stack three shows in this in this thing, and I had it rigged out so that I could sleep in it. And um, I traveled a lot in this in this element. It was extremely reliable, and uh, that's Amesbury Beach in Massachusetts, where my friends Ted Lee and Cecilia lived, and Ocean City on the right. And in 2015, I was asked to teach a class at um, the Kentucky School of Art and Art. Um, my friends, Churchill Davenport and Laurie Fader had begun this school. Laurie Fader is a fantastic painter. And I went down there to teach and I stayed with this lovely couple um, in their carriage house <laughs> and they commissioned a painting from me. And this is Dr. Lehman Gray who invented, um, he invented one of the, something to do with, with the, the heart 
when you're doing heart surgery that keeps the heart pumping and just a lovely person. And he sat for me for seven hours. His painting was done over the course of seven hours. And um, that's the completed painting. And this was my cousin, Phyllis, who sat for me uh, over here. And, uh, oh, so I had written myself a grant to go across Route 66 that year, and it was denied. But Louisville, Kentucky is only five hours from Chicago by element. And I had a cousin in Chicago who had a couch. So I went to Chicago and I went from Chicago all the way across Route 66 to Santa Monica, and then on up to Oregon and home. And these were taken in Arizona on the road. This That's me, I was doing yoga on one of the picnic benches uh, at the rest stop where I slept. And these are some of the sites along Route 66. I worked mostly in gouache or watercolor when I did this. And um, it's Amarillo on the left and Monterey Bay on the right. And Ghost Ranch on the left, which was a, an incredibly perfect day. In, in 2010, I had been thrown from a horse and my back was broken. And on this day, we went to go, go, go Ghost Ranch and I rode a horse for the first time in five years. And it was wonderful. And that's a little gouache painting and uh, the one on the right is uh, Santa Monica when I made it there. And this is Valle Caldera in um, New Mexico. This is a tiny little painting. It's not even six inches wide and it, it lives in the United Kingdom now. And when I got back home, uh, Kelly Lane, J. Kelly Lane, also a terrific painter, uh, asked if I could do a show at Captain Larry's, which is, which is a bar in South Baltimore. And so, Jim Hennessy, who was one of my teachers at MICA, said, aren't you gonna put up a map? You ought to put up a map and put a line up there showing people where you went. So I did, because he was right, as he usually was. <laughs> and this is a painting of the Wigwam Motel um, where I stayed for one night and, and they, they let me paint. And uh, on the way back, this was, it was, it was a full moon one night. And this was some field in Minnesota. I don't know where it was, but I decided to, take a self-portrait. And then I started doing, um, you know, kind of mixing memory and photographs and studies. And this is a photograph of my mom. It's from a photograph of her at Ocean City. And the Ferris wheel is from a painting that I did that was a failed painting, but I used it as a study and I used several beach studies. And um, I began working like this, like periodically, uh, when the weather was too bad, even for me to, to go out. And this was the second year that I taught in Kentucky. Um, and this is, um, uh, each year I would do a different road. So the second year I did Highway 61 and I was gonna make it to all the Jimmy Webb cities, but I only got to Galveston. By the time I get to Phoenix, I'll probably be 70. <laughs> but um, That's a joke if you don't know Jimmy Webb's songs, because he wrote, he wrote that song by the time I get to Phoenix. Anyway, um, this was this is also a very small painting. It's about like this. And it's the view from the campsite um, where I was in um, Zion National Park. And this is uh, on the left, that's um, Santa Fe. It's the church in Santa Fe in the square, which looks just like Mexico, it's crazy. Um, Craig Hankin has that, actually Esther Hankin has that. And on the right, um, these are mountains in the Rio Grande in New Mexico. I stayed with my cousin Shelly when I was in New Mexico, which is wonderful. And these were some of the paintings, I think, from 2017. In the, in the meantime, the second year that I went to Kentucky, I was asked to teach this color and design class. And I didn't want to do it because I didn't know anything about it. And my friend Laurie Fader said, I'm going to show you how to teach it. And she did. And it, it borrowed a lot from um, Pratt where they, you have to have two semesters of color and design. And it really changed the way I thought about color and the way even I thought about paint. I started thinking more and more about the way the paint itself relates on the, on the page, not necessarily about the subject, but about the whole, just the painting as an object itself and, um, and movement and design, which had been a four letter word. And I welcomed it into my vocabulary at that point, but was just thinking more and more about complementary colors and how they 
uh, affect each other and analogous colors and doing, you know, doing paintings based on different palettes. And these are paintings that I did in Louisville, some of them along with my students. And I was teaching this landscape class as well. And then I would come home and paint um, with my friend, Bob, who I didn't mention uh, when I was in UPenn, I, I said I was really unhappy, but I would come home every weekend and I would paint the landscape with Bob Newtz. And I truly believe he's responsible for maintaining any shred of sanity that I had. I really looked forward to coming home those days and going out, no matter the weather, we painted in snowstorms, we painted in rain, it was freezing and I had a Jeep with no heat, but did it anyway and it was great. And um, he had started painting down at Fort McHenry. Um, I had been thinking about it, <laughs> but he actually did it and got me down there. And um, these are some of the paintings from Fort McHenry. The one on the right is, uh, is another really little, it's a little guy and, uh, and flowers. Uh, and and cigar boxes. I had been painting on cigar boxes and painting different flowers. Cigar boxes are kind of a throwaway thing. And the other like psychological thing that happens with me, and I think with a lot of painters, is when you have like a really good canvas and a really good piece of paint, you don't want to ruin it. So you do one of the worst paintings you've ever done. And so I painted on paper and cigar boxes because I could throw them away, no big deal. And I think these are some of the best paintings that I did were the cigar box paintings. I, I uh, this little chrysanthemum in a in a jar, and um, these blue flowers. That's on a that's on a canvas, but it was like a throwaway canvas. I didn't care about it. And more flower paintings. They're good models. They hold pretty still. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate. Also, I didn't mention it, but I live in the house where I grew up. My brother and sister gave me the shares that they would have inherited. So I have space. Um, I can, and, and I can put my palette in my freezer and my mother, who is no longer with us, can't yell at me for it. I can paint in any room of the house. <laughs> and, and it's, um, and I have, I have that 68 box of crayons. <laughs> I have it now, but uh, it's, it's, been wonderful. I, I would not have the freedom to paint what I do without this. So I'm very fortunate and, and I know how lucky I am. Um, these are painted on panel. And uh, these are these are some other paintings. These here are from the summer of 2017 when I went to the Northeast. My cousin got married in Chicago and I traveled up North and back over to Maine and then down South and then to Scotland. So on the left, I think that's Casco Bay. And on the right is, um, that's part of, that's part of Centerport, Northport Harbor, where my sister lives on Long Island. Um, Wintertime from my backyard. This is a 24 by 24 inch painting. And my friends still sit for me. Anne Marie came over and took a nap and let me paint her. And I, I just really like this painting. She has it. It's about 12 inches square. Um, I also like squares. I was told when I started painting that um, squares were the most difficult thing to, to paint. And so I did them. And, and, and I have fun solving them. You know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. This is uh, in Hastings. My son and his family moved to England, in, to Scotland in 2015. And uh, I called him and I said, well, I'm, I'm coming over and he said, well, and I said, I'm going to do it for a month because I'm not going to come over there for like a week. And there was this long pause. And my son said, you know, uh, we can't take you for a month, Ma. So I have friends. <laughs> so I stayed with friends in England um, for a couple of weeks and uh, painted down there. And this, this is this is gouache. Uh, traveling with paint and oil paint is difficult. Your brushes will probably survive. You can pack your tubes in your... Uh, check-in, um, but gouache is small, it's less expensive, and if, if they confiscate it, you can buy more. And uh, these are also gouache paintings from the same trip. And then I would come home uh, in the fall, I can't remember what year these started, I think it was 2015, and um, Sid Wolf and Germ Germano of Germanos in Little Italy 
had a Madanari festival and I was invited to come and uh, it's all pastel. It all gets washed away uh, as soon as the rain comes. And um, I would participate in these. And it used to start on Friday, which I could never do because I was always teaching. But Saturday, I would roll out there with my pastels and a master painting. And um, the first one I did on, on the left here was uh, the slaying of Marcius. And it was done for some festival day. <laughs> so maybe the slaying of Mar the flaying of Marcius wasn't particularly appropriate. <laughs> But um, it was a challenge. And um, this this particular year, this was the last year that they did it. And uh, that was um, the Goya painting about the, the, the revolution. And uh, you can see a man of color lifting his hands up, you know, don't shoot. And a lot of the people that came to the festival thought it was Freddie Gray. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. The picture on the right was taken by my friend Dina Margolis, and that's me. <laughs> this is uh, more of the painting. I don't think I ever got a full uh, view of it, but you can see the, you know, on the right here, are these guys with the guns and the dead guy there. Is it a pastel, uh, Barbara? These are pastels. These are dry pastels. And if they ever have this again, the modern art artists are unbelievable. They, um, it's an incredible uh, uh, discipline. I I'm like, you know, I'm like a rank amateur in there uh, and I was having fun, but some really beautiful uh, paintings. And it's, you know, it's the Madonna. It's supposed to be the Madonna and as in Madanari. And, and they do this, they still do it in Italy. It, it, it's really something. I, would, I was very honored to participate. And this is my husband. I met him, uh, met him on OK Cupid in 2018. And we met each other for the first time months after that. And he would sit for me and, and, uh, and sit for me <laughs> and sit for me. <laughs> and we, um, we decided to get married in, 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 and we got married in 2020. And just in time for the pandemic. So we had an enforced honeymoon, which, which was okay. You know, we're, we're still, he's still here. He's still sitting. And uh, these are all him. Yeah, there's more, more Tim. <laughs> and during the pandemic, um, I, was, I was teaching. And uh, that summer, I don't know if you guys remember it. There were no airplanes. Nobody's, nobody's driving. The colors, the colors. I had not seen colors like that since I was a child. And I wanted to paint. I, I painted all I could, but I was spending most of my summer learning how to teach on Zoom. And so um, didn't get as much. But these are kids in the neighborhood running around. And there's a fair amount of invention here. You know, this tree exists someplace else. And this is Alvaja, the kid up the street, who's <laughs> he, to his mother's mortification. He always says, Hi, Barb, how you doing? It's like, that's Mrs. Gruber, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> and and these kids, uh, you know, these are these are just you know as as I was watching them, it's just same way I would paint people on the beach. And this is a, a watercolor and gouache. This is an oil painting, and this is a black and white uh, demo that I ended. I was painting for my students. Um, and in twenty twenty one, in, in twenty twenty, yeah, I got a commission to paint the president of suburban hospital and and it was terrific i think it came in march of 21 in january of 21 i had been diagnosed with breast cancer um it was right after our anniversary and my husband you know fortunately for me he didn't buy the extended warranty so he had to keep me <laughs> here i am and and i'm okay but it was a difficult year and i was painting this um at that time which had a deadline I think of, of November, 2021, I had developed an infection that traveled to my spine uh, after the surgery and it, nothing got, it's March, April, May, June, July, August, it was like seven months. I'm not complaining. I had a very mild form of breast cancer. I'm alive. I, it could have been a whole lot worse, but it made it difficult to work. And this woman is just lovely. And I just hope that I conveyed her humanity and her kindness 
uh, I struggled with this painting a lot. It was done with a combination of drawings, uh, color studies, and photographs. And this was entirely from photographs. This was a commission done at the same time. And um, it's five feet square? Six, I don't know, something like that. And, um, but no deadline. So I was able to work on this uh, more at my own speed. My favorite part of this painting is the dog. <laughs> and, and this was another commission that came later. Um, one of the people at, in Long Island, when I was a grad student, I painted a lot of boats at Cold Spring Harbor. And I had painted his boat a couple of times. And when um, his wife, Candy, when her horse died, she commissioned me to do a painting of the horse. Um, it was also done entirely from photographs. And people just take good pictures <laughs> while, while everybody's alive. <laughs> just in case, you know, thank God for Photoshop. You know, I could manipulate some of this to get more shadows and stuff like this. It's a terrible slide. I, I couldn't get, I never did get a really good picture of it. Um, but because you know, there's all that light shines on it, but I'm really proud of this painting. It's uh, 60 by 40 or something like that. And um, it turned out well. That The horse's name was Twiggy. And these are computer doodles. Um, I have an iPad and, a, and a, a program called Autodesk Sketchbook. And I, they're great. You know, you can take a sketch pad with you anywhere, but these are terrific, like even in the dark. The one on the left was done in a nightclub um, at... Um, Oh, corner, I can't remember, something corner uh, in downtown Baltimore where they have a lot of jazz musicians. And this was done at Germano's. These are the Worthy Brothers who are physical therapists by day and jazz musicians by night. And Sid asked me if I would, if I would do this. And this was a, a painting, uh, um, one of the security guards at MICA uh, Officer Green, his mother passed away, and he asked me if I would do a painting of her. And he had this fantastic photograph. And she was standing in front of the station building where he worked. But this was taken, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So I, I did this from the photograph and from studies of Micah. And um, I think it's a really powerful image. I like it. And then these are paintings of the neighborhood. This is what I paint. It's just everything that's around me. I don't travel as much anymore. My car was uh, killed in a hit and run uh, in April, but even before that, the pandemic kind of curtailed things. And this is the house across the street. It's a wash drawing on the left. And um, these are older paintings that I started in the 2010s, 2012s, and then came back to and worked on them and completed them just this year. These are 24 by 24. And I put these two together. This is the same painting. I had done this in 2012. And then this year, I painted that house out of it. And it completely changed the painting. I know that these are different colors. I couldn't get the right, um, couldn't get a good shot uh, to match uh, color-wise. But it totally changed it. And uh, I think it made it better. And I showed it at the Bethesda Painting Awards. So it was uh, pretty cool. There it is. And it's a fairly large painting for me. It's um, 30 some inches, 40 some inches, I can't remember. And this painting on the left, this is uh, our backyard. We got a dog. <laughs> My husband got a dog. We got, uh, I wanted a, a fully trained six year old flat coat retreater and we, retriever and we ended up with a four month old Jack Russell Terrier. So we built a fence. <laughs> My husband says it's now officially the most expensive dog he's ever had. And that's the, the backyard, the, the fence. So I, it's nice. I, I, I'm so grateful to Mark, uh, especially for making me appreciate my surroundings and what I have. Because I would never have painted this when I was a first year student. I would never have just gone out in the yard and painted it. Uh, Hollyhocks this summer my husband again, and there's Steve. The dog's name is Steve. That's why I, I didn't want a dog like that. He kept picking out these dogs and then he said, well, this one's name is Steve and that's my son's name. So I looked at him <laughs> and now we, now he lives with us. 
<laughs> but uh, that's that's the two of them. Uh, and this is my favorite painting that I think I've ever done. Um, I've, I've got to figure this out, but I put treats up here for up, 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 up here on the couch so that Steve would fall asleep there. And you can see where he actually started down here a little bit, but uh, he ended up up there. I don't have to give Tim treats. He's, he's pretty good. He sits on his phone. And, uh, and this was um, the residency in Romania. That's a little gouache painting. And it, I painted in the city. And this is just, you know, this is like the first day of the painting and the finished painting and, and the mountains and the beach. And that was the show. And I think that's the end of the slideshow. Oh, there you. Um, right. Thank you so much. For, it was so great to see all the, the pieces kind of like come together in the, in the training and, and who kind of uh, influenced you over the years. Um, I had a, some, of course, boring, like arty technical stuff, like, but w one thing that I'm just curious about right off the bat was, you know, when you're working really big, like over 40 inches on a side, and then, you know, I see also really tiny 12 by 12 yeah. inch paintings or whatever, very small paintings yeah, tiny. And, and, and smaller for doing plein air. What, do you have to like rewire your brain when you're going from very large to very small uh, or even from gouache to oil, does it does it feel like a, a stretch for you? And uh, do you change brushes? Like, how does that kind of translate? Yeah. Definitely change brushes. You can't use the same brushes for gouache that I do with. Do Do you change when you when you use? Absolutely. Like, yeah. 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 Because I, I you can't do that. I I I don't like to shift. You know, um, I avoid it because of the fear. But, you know, once a minute, it's okay. Uh, but, but, you know, it's funny, you know, you, I think you, you never know, like sometimes you don't do something for a long time and then you go back to it and you do like one of the best paintings you've ever done. And sometimes it just takes painting after painting after painting to get back into it. So that's, that's it. I definitely switch brushes. Um, logistics are the most difficult part of big painting. And, you know, sometimes I just don't want to make a mess. Oil painting is messy. And because um, I'm going to have to clean it up. <laughs> so. What about like your daily life? I mean, I, I was I was always in the um, I, I love this concept of, you know, when Picasso was asked, how often do you paint? And his response was, I'm painting right now. And I, th does that kind of resonate with you, too? Do you always see the world through a painter's lens? Yes. <laughs> it's it's, it's, like, it's like you're always thinking, what would I mix up to get that? You know, and and and. Or worrying, I'm not painting, I'm not painting. What am I doing? And then I, I kind of, I have to take a breath and say, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. This is feeding your painting and it'll be okay. It gets more difficult as I get older because my health gets a little bit more unpredictable. So I never know, like, I, I, I think, okay, I'm going to work real hard on this school thing, and then I'll be able to paint. And then something happens, and I'm in the doctor's office. <laughs> it's like, so um, I'm working on, I've, I've way pared back my teaching schedule. Um, but at the same time, teaching became much more demanding after COVID. Um, I think we're coming out of it. I think that students... I didn't even talk about teaching. I, I just think teaching is really important. I, I learn a ton from teaching. Um, it, it keeps me fresh. Every time I have to explain to a student why something is important, I'm re-explaining that to myself and reaffirming it, or maybe realizing well, that's not important. <laughs> and so, so that's that's kind of a of a cool thing. But it takes a lot of energy to teach, as you know. Um, and that lately I've started just drawing in my classes with my students. <laughs> and see if they, if they were okay with that. Did that answer your question? Was that, was that, was that, was that? Could yeah. I ask a question? I love gouache and I was curious about, do you always do it on paper? Is there a particular kind of paper you use and how large can you go with gouache? Oh, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I don't know how long I gouache. The largest I've painted with gouache <laughs> is probably 12 by 12. That's what I would think. And do you use a specific grainy paper or what do you do it on? I like grainy paper, yeah. Um, yeah. but I also use uh, what I can afford. <laughs> um, the fluid paper is a, is a kind of a smooth, it's called fluid. It's got, it comes with an orange pad. 
oh. I use that a lot. But if I can get hold of that, that painting in Maine, that was on gouache and that was done on Archer's watercolor paper. So I was wondering, have you ever done black, against black, a board, blackboard? I haven't. I, 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 I took a class with Walt Bartman in, in gouache and one of the experiments was on blackboard. It's really fun. So, I bet. <laughs> I bet. Well, because when you paint on a tone on a tone surface, but it's similar, but it's 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 very different. Yeah, Just, yeah, it's funny. Um, Lenart never painted on tone. He he eschewed tone surfaces because he was always about like the the nature of the tone of the color coming out. But I um I eschewed eschewing that. <laughs> I paint on tone surfaces a lot. Uh, for me, it does help. I'm gonna try that. Thank oh, you. Good. That's a that's a cool thing. No, yeah. I like it. I I find it so unpredictable gouache, uh, and but also much more predictable than watercolor. <laughs> and it's and you can be so much more bold. I mean, well, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Basically, I loved your the whole trajectory of your career and your passion of the different experiences that you've had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Continue to show it up. This is a. This is amazing, Barbara. Thank you so much. I wonder what your, do you have a favorite medium? Do you have a favorite way of working for your own? I really like oil paint. When I, when I first went to Catonsville Community College, we were working in acrylic. Uh, the fellow who, uh, Bill Zwingelberg, I think he had gotten cancer and was working only in acrylic at that point. And it was great. But then when I got to, to Micah and we started using oils, it was like, oh, <laughs> this, is, this is so nice. <laughs> it's a, it, it was a whole different, the transparency of it. And, and acrylic has changed now. I've, I've done a bunch of paintings in acrylic now. I did, I did show them. But they have like this, it's called fluid acrylic, comes in a jar and you can pour it. It's, it's great. It's got a lot of transparency. I love it. it, it the longer we live, the more stuff is going to come out that's going to make this stuff easier. And uh, I, I, that's my goal. You know. <laughs> and are you still painting plain air or outdoors? Oh, you yeah. said you're, yeah. You, yeah, you, that, the, all the, those paintings were all, you know, the, the hollyhocks and the yard and Tim and, well, that's inside. The fans, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But it gets now... Uh, and all those paintings in Romania were done outside in 97 degree heat. It, the heat, it, it, since I got heart disease, the heat really gets to me. And once it gets above a certain temperature, I, I just can't, you know, so I'll, I'll paint from inside of a window, but yeah. And in terms of teaching, Barbara, it, uh, do, how how do you manage, if, if you teach a lot, can you actually paint? <laughs> It's a little bit of a dilemma I have. The ideal, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to quit teaching. Uh, it feeds, it feeds me, and uh, you know, unless they throw me out or something. But um, because it does feed my painting, and it makes me think about how and why I paint, I would like to teach less. So the the trick is to find the ideal balance um, in classes, and you know. I, I work jobs where, you know, where I work 40, 50, 60 hours a week all year long. And now I have summers off. So it's, you know, I have that time to paint. It goes fast. But um, having that time is great. Do I paint as much as I want? No. And I can hear Barry and Amet saying, there's always a reason not to paint. And he's right. And he always carried those little sketchbooks around with him. He stuck in his pocket. And... Um, I do that. I, I will do that. But thank you for that because now I'll I'll start thinking about it more. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about you know the development of your color palette? I I know that you mentioned Israel and Mark, uh, but have you kind of created Sharon your... Yates? Sharon Yates is from Sharon okay. Yates, uh, of all people. <laughs> Sharon Yates. Sharon Yates sidled up to me in my in my senior year at Micah and said, you know, I think you're a really good painter. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> and she said, 
I think you should come to Canada with me. <laughs> I did that same trip actually with her. I did. I did this trip to Canada and she sat down with me with a palette and paint and showed me how to mix color. Nobody had done that before. She took, and I do this with my students now. She took a huge pile of ultramarine and a teeny pile of orange and then a medium pile of orange and a medium pile of ultramarine and then a teeny pile of ultramarine and a huge pile of orange. And she mixed them all together. And then she said, look at what you get. And here, look what happens if you add white. Look what happens if you add alizarin. Look what happens if you add this, that, and the other. It was transformational. And um, that that helped a lot. The other thing that was a, a huge um, painting with Bob, he's got a fantastic sense of color. Um, and of course, Mark and Leonard and those guys, but also teaching that color class and painting with Laurie Fader, who, who we would also go out and paint. Laurie Fader is absolutely free. She'll try anything and with anything. You know, you want to glue paper and bits of candy to it, and it still comes out looking like a beautiful painting. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. But teaching that color class, and we used color pencil. We used, uh, you know, the paper, the Albers paper, um, buttons, trash. Uh, what else? We um, A gouache. And, and, and that was terrific. You know, like when we used the color pencil, we only used red blue and yellow and white. And you had to mix all your colors from that. It was, it was, it was very um, transformational. That. And there's, oh, there's some guy, Walt talk, talks about him. There's this guy that paints water, people in the water with reflections. Oh, Irish guy, Irish painter. John somebody. Contemporary. Anyway, his color palette, I think, is really interesting. The way he gets the those bright water reflections. How about John Murray? He yeah, teaches the, in Virginia. No, I can't remember the guy's name. Okay. But they're very, they're very, um, the paintings are not, uh, they're not picky at all. You know, he's not going into individual features. It's, you know, a, a, a slash for a, a, a face and an arm and this which turns into the face, you know, it, it becomes it, but it's, it's very much about how the color creates it. Any other final questions for our esteemed guest? <laughs> <laughs> you want to see the studio in progress? Yeah, sure. For all, all. And there are a couple of comments, uh, just thanking oh. you and, and talking about how wonderful your presentation and your journey was. Oh. you do know. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Here, come into my studio. So my studio down here was flooded. Oh no. A year or so ago. And um, <clears throat> I had to move it upstairs. So it's moving back down. And uh, this is this is it. Oh, there's another painting of Tim and Steve, right? Painting after painting after painting. <laughs> A bunch of pastels that I, I didn't uh, talk about. But uh, my friend Larsha did that print up there. And um, and this is this is the the studio. This, this was a painting that I did in Leonard's class, and I meant to put it in the presentation because I think it really feels like a Leonard Anderson painting. Um, oh, can you see it? Yeah, there we go. And uh, and this is the painting that I'm working on now. Yeah, and then all of these in the back. So it's nice. I'm going to enlarge this door. And oh, this painting here is an early painting by Laurie Fader. The, um, I don't know if you can see that. I have to put that back up. And then, you know, these are a number of the paintings that were from that the, the show are up here for the presentation. And oh, I bought all the horses when I did the um, the painting of the horse. <laughs> And then is the, the thing of, about how being down here is it leads into the garage, which is a mess. But oh, there's oh, one of the huge paintings of the house across the street. <laughs> but this is going to be my workshop where I'll be able to frame drafting table and and storage. 
So it's going to be really nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing, Barbara. Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks, right? Thank you so much. In two weeks. Thank you guys yes. very much. You want to say a little bit about and, and in two weeks are, are the artist? Bob Knudsen, Robert Knudsen is the artist that's coming in two weeks. Uh, I went to school with him at Catonsville Community College. And um, he was a standout there. He 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 thinks about things differently. He tells you just what he thinks. <laughs> and he and he and he does it in a way that you know, you'll say, uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and he, um, he was, he was always painting the landscape. He also took Mark's class, but not with me. We, we went to Micah at different times and, um, he, he introduced me to the, the gallery lady at, the, um, we both showed at that gallery at La Petite Gallery and just, we've been in a bunch of shows together. He's a stellar human being and a fantastic painter, and he just gets better and better. He retired a couple years ago and picked up the guitar, uh, which he's also really good at now. And, and he paints more and more. And he paints a lot of beach paintings. I'm sure you'll see a lot of those. Um, he's also a builder. That's how he's, he started out as a builder and then uh, became a painter. And uh, I am just privileged to know the guy. And I, I hope you show up, because I know it's going to be a good presentation. So, so, so come back in two weeks for another ACO and we'll see Barbara again and Bob. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. much. People My wish pleasure. you good health also. Thank and, you. And Thanks for the present to that. <laughs> to all of us, to all of us. Yes. The world needs our paintings. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a Thank great you. week. Thank you so much.